Good afternoon, everyone across the country. My name is Tim Phillips. I'm president of Americans for Prosperity. Uh, out on the road, we were in Des Moines, Iowa, just a couple of nights ago with a big grassroots event in uh, uh, Representative Axney's district, who's been voting with Speaker Pelosi for all this, frankly, socialistic type red, uh, legislation in Washington. Today, I'm near Kansas City, Missouri, and it's a little different today. Our guest is someone who's a friend and ally on these big issue battles we're fighting. And I'll tell you, friends across the country, it's a big moment for the country. I'm glad you're watching. Uh, it's a big moment. We've got Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and sadly, President Biden, who frankly had promised to be more bipartisan. He hasn't been. He's trying to jam through this far left agenda on so many issues. And now we've got another big battle brewing on this tax and spend bill. We're gonna talk about it today with a special guest and key ally to introduce him is Jeremy Katie. Jeremy is our Americans for Prosperity, Missouri State Director doing so much good work in that state. Jeremy, take it away. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, my name is Jeremy Katie, State Director here in Missouri. I wanna thank you for joining us as well. And just like Tim, we've been all over the state uh, of Missouri. We've been talking about healthcare, uh, how to reimagine healthcare, and, and working with activists all across the state, uh, engaging with uh, legislators here in Jefferson City. Uh, but today, it's my privilege uh, to introduce a really good friend of mine that I've had the pleasure of knowing since uh, he was in the Missouri legislature. But since 2013, he's been serving the good people of the 8th Congressional District in Southwest Missouri. I know he has a passion for eliminating burdens and reg regulations and is watchful over our tax dollars as a member of the House Budget Committee. Uh, because of your unique position, uh, Congressman Jason Smith, on the Budget Committee, can you guide us through some of the reasons why you oppose DC's recent $1.4 trillion bailout? Absolutely. Jeremy, it's great to be with you, Tim. It's great to be with you as well, even though it's virtual, we're together. So um, I'm glad to be there. But the, the Biden bailout bill that, that was passed, um, some people will try to call it the COVID bill. It wasn't COVID. Less than 9% of all the spending in the $1.9 trillion package was actually going towards healthcare spending um, to put shots in people's arms to, to crush the virus. The rest of it, the rest of it was basically rewarding political friends, donors, and allies of President Biden, Schumer, Pelosi. Uh, they tried to say that that bill was imminent. We needed to pass it. This is the sixth COVID bill that has been passed. And we still had a trillion dollars, Jeremy, left over from the five prior ones that had not been spent. There was money there. It didn't need additional money. They just needed another 1.9 trillion because they needed to reward the blue state governors. And that's in fact what the majority of this bill does. Something that's really crazy, Jeremy, that in this bill, they changed the, the funding formula of how they would distribute all of the funds to the different different states, different than the five prior COVID packages. They did it in a way that it, it was very advantageous to blue states, states that Joe Biden won, and it punished states uh, like Missouri lost over $800 million because Trump won that state. But you know, the two states that had the biggest windfall was first, California, and second was New York. New York's windfall, just by a simple change in their formula, was $2.1 billion in increased funding. Remember that number, $2.1 billion, because just in the last two weeks, I've sent a letter to the administration asking for an investigation because the New York state legislative body and the governor has recently passed their budget and they set up this separate fund of $2.1 billion that is solely used to write $15,600 checks to illegal immigrants who may have suffered any kind of issues from COVID, but they had to be illegal immigrants. And the fact that it's $2.1 billion, the same amount of money that they got as a net increase from the COVID package. It must be investigated. That's why we've called on the investigation. But I've said all along, Jeremy, this bill was the wrong plan at the wrong time. 
for all the wrong reasons. And we could go line by line. For example, even in that bill, they stopped the states from being able to reduce their own taxes. I mean, th th these big spending packages have one thing in common. It's about having more control over families, over communities, over states and local municipalities, because the more federal control that they can have in Washington, D.C., the easier it is for them to push their progressive wish list, that, wish list, and that's exactly their ultimate goal. Yeah, and Congressman Smith, thank you for detailing that last package. And I'll tell you, I think a lot of folks across the country, I know I felt this way, were encouraged that the entire House Republican Caucus voted no against that. That's good for the Republican Party, good for you guys in that House Caucus to, as a block, say, look, we're not going to go down this road again. It's too much spending, too much of this, as you said, a liberal wish list. So now President Biden and Speaker Pelosi are pushing what looks like a $2.3 trillion additional spend. This time, they're talking about big tax increases. I know you've been already digging in against this. Can you give folks watching or watching live now and in the future a sense of what is in this package, especially on the tax side? Tim, it's a repeat of the Biden bailout bill. I call this one the Biden boondoggle, you know, because it's clearly what it is. Less than 6%, less than 6% of the $2.3 trillion proposed piece of legislation actually goes towards roads and bridges. Less than 6%, less than 2% goes to airports, locks and dams, ports, and less than 5% goes to broadband. So essentially less than 13% of $2.3 trillion goes towards infrastructure. You have some senators and some of my colleagues up here that are coming up with new definitions of infrastructure. I mean, they care more about social engineering than they actually do about structure engineers. Um, it, it, is, it is madness. And the way that they want to fund this is by creating the largest tax increases in the history of our country. I'm telling you, they are trying to raise taxes to such a level for businesses that they would be higher than that of communist China. Think about this. If, if Biden and Pelosi and Schumer has their way with this package, it basically would incentivize manufacturers or businesses across this country. Say for example, a business in Sykeston, Missouri, they would be benefited by firing all their employees, employees closing their shop and moving to Beijing and opening up because under this proposal, they would have a lower tax rate. That is simply wrong. It's awful. You know, Republicans and Democrats both have had, 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 had they've had a spending problem. There's no question about it. Um, it seems like that Republicans have been in the billions and Democrats is now in the trillions. And, 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 and just to tell you like, how big $2.3 trillion is, the best way that I can explain it is you think about the entire national interstate highway system, okay? You may be driving on it right now, Tim, but it, the yeah. national interstate highway system, to completely build that entire highway system in today's dollars, you could do that four times in $2.3 trillion. Four times. That's incredible. That's how insane it is. Yeah. Now that's incredible. Ladies and gentlemen watching, it's time for you to make your voice heard. Click on the I Volunteer link right here on this Facebook thread, the I Volunteer link. It takes about a minute of your time. You'll be able to send a message uh, saying, hey, vote no on this tax and spend package that Congressman Smith has just detailed for us. Uh, it'll also go to your two United States senators. Now's a moment to make your voice heard. I'm telling you, in these next few weeks, this battle is going to be occurring. We need to hear from you. But frankly, more important than AFP, your member of Congress and your two senators need to hear from you. Uh, Jeremy, go ahead. I, I didn't mean to jump back in there, but I want <laughs> to make sure folks have an opportunity to, to go to weigh in against this boondoggle, the Biden boondoggle. I like how that's phrased, Congressman. 
No, thank you, Congressman. Yeah, and, and you know, having been in the Missouri legislature, you know how important it is to to have a balanced budget. You know, in Missouri, um, you know, we have to we have to balance our budget. Uh, we have to control what our spending is. Uh, do you see that on the federal level, um, or what are some of the issues that you see with the federal level as far as that spending goes? You know, we're dealing with the infrastructure, uh, the, the the trillions of dollars that they're spending. Uh, is there any way that uh, we can potentially rein that in? Jeremy, uh, spending's out of control. Uh, to tell you how out of whack our our spending is and where our debt is, think about this. There at the the state level in the state of Missouri, the the state budget is probably $35, $36 billion. Just last month alone, Jeremy, just the interest on our debt at the federal level was just over $30 billion last month. And so think about that. We just pay on a monthly basis on interest of our debt what the entire year of spending for the state of Missouri is. That's awful. And that should that should make everyone everyone think about how scary it is. You know, what happened just two weeks ago, uh, Biden issued his he called it a skinny budget. I call it the back of an envelope budget because it wasn't complete. It only addressed discretionary spending. It didn't even hit the mandatory spending, which takes up three fourths of our entire spending virtually. And in that proposal, it, it was 58 pages, 58 pages. And it was like 146 times they mentioned climate change and three times um, three times in regards to our border. I mean, that, that we, we clearly see where the issues are. And when you look at what they did, they did on average a 16% across the board of non-security, non-defense items in the budget but when it came to Homeland Security, their increase was zero. And just last month alone, Jeremy, we saw over 172,000 people illegally detained and crossed the southern border. That's more than the entire population of the city of Springfield, Missouri, that just came across in the month of March in the southern border. But they're not funding or making that as a priority, but instead, Biden, in the first three hours in office, by executive order, by the stroke of the pen, violated the Budget Impoundment Act by the stroke of the pen by halting the funding to finish the border wall, which was appropriated by Congress in billions of dollars in a bipartisan fashion. But, you know, I, I, I want to remind everyone, if you recall, the first impeachment of Donald Trump was because of pausing funding to Ukraine. That's why it was. In the first three hours of this presidency, he stopped funding that was appropriated by Congress for the Southern Wall, which the GAO said that the president should not have stopped the money to Ukraine. Where are they right now? The only thing that has changed in this situation is who occupies the White House. And you, we've talked about the tax increases in this new $2.3 trillion spending bill. We've talked about uh, the some of the, just the massive level of spending, but also Congressman Smith, there are elements of the Green New Deal as we understand it in this brand new package. It'll re-regulate this economy. Uh, it, it, it spends, as I understand it, if I'm wrong on this, correct, because I wanna make sure we're, we're accurate. My understanding is it, it literally spends billions and billions on electric cars you know, picking out them as winners and losers and claiming that is somehow about infrastructure, which is not roads and bridges for sure. But can you touch on this Green New Deal and, and, and what it does to our economy and, and frankly, what it does to working folks and Americans on fixed incomes as they see utility bills go up, gas prices go up. Give us a sense of that, if you would. You know, this plan spends 74% more on subsidies for electric cars than it does for broadband to, to give you some kind of number. But $600 billion is estimated in this budget that is policies to implement the Green New Deal, $600 billion. Over $400 billion in this $2.3 trillion package is used to expand Obamacare 
So this is an infrastructure bill. It should be about roads and bridges, but like what I told you, less than 6% roads and bridges, less than 2% are ports, ports, airports, um, locks and dams, and less than 5% is broadband. There is a considerably amount of money to implement the Green New Deal. That's basically, it's not an infrastructure package, it's the Green New Deal. They just, you know, changed the name um, and called it infrastructure. But that's that's what this is. And, and it looks like they're going to try to use the budget process of reconciliation um, to try to pass it through where they can bypass the filibuster requirements of the U.S. Senate. As you all know, the U.S. Senate is a 50-50 split and the tie-breaking vote goes to the vice president. In the House of Representatives, it's 212 to 218. So virtually, if we can get three Democrats, three Democrats to stand with us and Republicans all stand together, we could kill that piece of legislation. You know, when, when the budget resolution that created the reconciliation instructions for that big Biden bailout bill that I referred to a little bit ago, the only thing, Tim, that was bipartisan about that bill was bipartisan opposition. We had folks in committee vote against the Biden bailout bill, and we had Democrats on the floor vote against it. Not enough, not enough, but hopefully we'll start getting more. Jeremy, go ahead. Um, uh, thank you, Tim. Um, by all reports, the the you know the economy is growing. Um, you know, the businesses are starting to open up. People are starting to go back to work. Um, you see travel starting to increase across the nation. Um, as un unemployment continues to fall, uh, do what is what we need uh, through DC another massive jobs bill uh, to help uh, try to push and and open up some more jobs. Jeremy, they tried to say that the last bill was a jobs bill. It was another wasteful spending approach. I tried to raise numerous, uh, even a CBO, even the CBO came out and said that this money was not necessary. I told you that there were, we had more than a trillion dollars from the five prior packages that had not been spent. There was no need for an additional 1.9 trillion. The CBO already projected that by by um, later later part of this year, that we would hit some of the highest GDP growth that we've seen in a long time. Unemployment's continuing to close. What people want is for these lockdowns to end, for governments to open up, for people to have the freedom to go back to work, to um, to be able to operate their businesses, to have their kids in person schools. That's what they want, and that's what will change the economy. Look at the state of Missouri. Governor Parson had done, has done an incredible job in how he's handled this, and that's why we are in the top 10 of the lowest unemployment in the nation. And because these lockdowns, these lockdowns don't work. And it, 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 it's just, it, it's madness to think that, that you have to, that, that, that the Democrats believe spending money creates jobs. It just causes more debt to our kids and grandkids. Think about this, with these proposals that's before us right now, these spending packages, if the Democrats have their way of this 2.3 trillion and an additional multiple trillion dollar bill that they're gonna announce just next week on top of this, plus the 6 trillion that has been spent in the last year, that's $10 trillion. You know how much $10 trillion is? That's more than, all the wages of every American worker in our country for a year. That's all of your wages, Jeremy, all of mine, all of yours, Tim, and everyone that's listening and everyone who's not listening in the United States. That's 10 trillion. That is what will have been spent in one year. It's unsustainable and it's absolutely reckless. And I said earlier, Republicans and Democrats have both had spending problems. But let me tell you in perspective of how bad this is. Since Nancy Pelosi took over as Speaker of the House in 2018, in the last 27 months, they've added $9 trillion to the deficit, $9 trillion. In the entire time that Republicans have ever controlled Congress, and that was for 72 combined years, in those 72, 72 combined years that Republicans have ever controlled Congress, we have never added up $9 trillion on the deficit. 
I mean, that should tell you how big the last 20, 27 months has been. No, that's a great point. Well, ladies and gentlemen watching, click that I volunteer link, make your voice heard. It's a big moment. And I'll tell you something. In a nation's history, there are inflection points, moments in time that simply matter more than others. I believe these next few months battling these tax and spend bills and this PRO Act, which we haven't even gotten to, which is a horrific union power grab, and this HR1, which will strip away free speech protections and federalize elections. We're at a big moment in our nation's history. And, and Congressman Smith made a point that I want to echo. We only need six, seven, eight House Democrats to begin voting with us, and we can stop some of this. Let's help make that happen. I was in Iowa and Iowa 3 urging Representative Axey to do the right thing. We're going to keep doing that at AFP. I know that you want to do your part. So, Congressman, let's close with this if we could. Would you give, because often I hear people say, activists say, you know, my House member or my senator, they're great. They're going to vote the right way. They don't need to hear from me. Or they'll say, gosh, I know they're on the other side of this issue. I'm not going to waste my time. But could you take a moment and explain to folks watching why, in fact, it does matter whether it's encouraging a member who's doing the right thing or letting them know folks back home are watching when they're doing the wrong thing. Give folks a sense. You're on the inside. You see that. You talk to your colleagues Give a sense of what it means when you hear from a lot of people or your colleagues hear from a lot of folks back home on an issue like this tax and spend bill. Absolutely, Tim. It's so important for your constituents to, to let you know um, what they're thinking, what they care about. Um, uh, and, and, and I would encourage everyone who's out there that even if you even if you're pretty certain that your member, your, your congressman or your senator is with you, it's good for you to still contact them and to reiterate that support and say, keep fighting, you're doing the right thing. Because let me tell you, um, the more we fight back, the more that the other side who does not live in our state or our congressional district will target our phone lines, our office. They will try to inundate our phone lines to obstruct us, to try to put the fear of us that we're doing the wrong thing. And, you know, for the most part, I think most of my colleagues are strong enough and, and they're in those positions, but it would also be helpful for, for their, their, their bosses, their constituents to call up and say, hey, keep fighting, keep looking out for our freedoms, our values, um, stop allowing the Democrats to continue to, you know, put a mortgage on my grandkids' future. And so I, I, it cannot go over well enough, whether it's calling them, writing them, sending messages on social media, I'll tell you, um, the left loves to attack the conservatives who are pushing back. Um, and we just, we just have to keep keep pushing. And so if you all can ever help us, um, it's, it's much appreciated. Well said. You have been hearing from Congressman Jason Smith from the great state of Missouri. Congressman, thank you for what you're doing. Keep the faith there. It's a big moment for the country. Jeremy Cady, thanks for all you're doing with Americans for Prosperity in Missouri. And ladies and gentlemen, let's make sure we do our part to protect and preserve freedom and prosperity in what is the greatest nation on earth. I'm Tim Phillips. Thank you for all you're doing.